book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. For this reason, I too, having heard of a faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, that do not cease giving thanks for you, who are making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, <clears throat> and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Uh, I don't know if your children are dismissed or not. Yeah, okay. You can be seated. On December 27, 2012, Timothy Henry Gray's body was discovered by children who were sledding under a Union Pacific Railroad overpass in Evanston, Illinois, as the temperatures had hit 10 degrees. Timothy Gray was 60 years old, and he was the half-great-nephew of Huguet Clark, who died in May 2011 at the age of 104. Timothy Gray tragically was unaware, he was unaware that he was potentially entitled to 6.25% of his great aunt's copper mining fortune, which was estimated to be worth over $300 million. The title of the article that announced this news was this, homeless man who didn't know he was a millionaire is found dead before he could be told about his fortune. Body of heir to 300 million discovered frozen to death under a railway bridge. This is a sad story. And the sad thing about this story is that this man died homeless when he was heir to some of the most exquisite homes. This man apparently lived and obviously died in poverty, sleeping under a bridge when he was heir to millions of dollars. He died poor, but he was actually rich. And this morning, we're gonna to continue to look at the book of Ephesians chapter one and if you were here before, we were looking at Paul, the Apostle Paul's praise to God for choosing his children and deciding to richly bless believers by his amazing grace. And Paul was basically praising God because God had decided to make us rich. And this morning, as we continue to look at this chapter we are going to focus on chapter one again in verses 15 through 23 and I, I like what one commentator did to he made a statement that set this up he said in ephesians 1 the what paul is doing is first he blesses god for having blessed us in christ then paul prays that god will open our eyes to grasp the fullness of this blessing. In Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14, Paul was proclaiming to Christians 
that God is worthy of praise because of how much he has blessed us. And then now in Ephesians 1, verses 15 to 23, Paul is praying for Christians to see that God is worthy of praise. And so this morning, if you would turn your Bible to Ephesians 1, when we look at verse 15, we're going to see why Paul is praying, how Paul is praying, and what Paul is praying. So as we begin, we're going to look first of all at why Paul is praying for Christians. If you'll look with me at verse 15, it says this very simply. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints. And so first, Paul is praying for Christians because he has a reason to pray. It's the very first thing the text says, for this reason. Now, when you read those three words for this reason, we must not disconnect them from what Paul just said in verses 3 through 14. Part of the reason for praying for believers is what Paul just explained in those verses. He just explained that God has a great and unstoppable plan of redemption, and God has chosen to include us as believers in this unstoppable plan. If any group of people on the planet have a reason to pray, it's Christians. Um, obviously, Paul just said how much God has blessed us in the beginning of Ephesians. And I want to uh, read another couple of verses from other texts that bring these points out. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 12. I probably won't read them all. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. It's like the psalmist has to kind of like slap himself to reality and tell himself, soul, bless the Lord, and forget none of his benefits. Because that's what happens when we, when we stop praising God. We forgot his benefits. Who pardons all your iniquities. He has forgiven you of all your sins. He heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Who satisfies your years with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Thank God he hasn't. For as, the, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Paul is praying for Christians because he has a reason to pray. One of the reasons that God empowers Paul's, one of the reasons that empowers Paul's prayer for Christians is that is God's plan to redeem. God has decided to graciously save his children from the penalty of sin. And so Paul prays for God's children. God has decided to graciously save his children from the power of sin. And so Paul prays for God's children. God has graciously decided to save his children one day from the presence of sin. And so Paul prays for God's children. The plan of knowing the plan of God will empower you to pray. You know why we don't pray sometimes? I feel like we don't pray because we are looking in the wrong direction. We are looking in the direction of people and circumstances. 
and not at God. We, when we think we are looking at God, we're not. At the end of the day, we are not looking at the God of Scripture at all, which is probably why we're not praying. Martin Luther was debating with Erasmus, and they were debating about God's being in control and people making choices, and I won't get into all that. But one of the things Luther said to Erasmus really makes you think. He told Erasmus, your thoughts of God are too human. Paul is praying for Christians because he has a reason. But it goes on because Paul is also praying for Christians because he has a purpose. In Ephesians 1 verses 3 to 14, Paul sees that a part of God's plan is the purpose to bring himself glory. In verse 3 it says, Paul starts by saying, The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of praise. In verse 6, he says, God did all this to the praise of the glory of his grace. In verse 12, he says again, God did all this to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. And then in verse 14, he says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. And then he ends that great sentence, to the praise of his glory. Paul's purpose in prayer is that Christians would see who God is, see what God has done for us. And when we truly see this, the result will be that we will praise God for his amazing grace and we will pray. Paul is praying for Christians because he has a reason. Paul is praying for Christians because he has a purpose. Of course, Paul's purpose is the purpose God had. And Paul is praying for Christians because he is thinking about people. In Ephesians 1.15, it's what he says. He says, for this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints. Paul isn't just praying this general prayer, okay, God bless the whole world. Uh, not saying that's a bad prayer. So Paul is praying for actual people. Paul heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among them. He heard of their love for the Lord. And he also knew these Ephesians. Obviously, Paul helped plant the church in Ephesus. Um, he had a, a long history of ministry in Ephesus. He knew these people. Obviously, since he hadn't been there for a while, there were new believers that had come into the body. But he had a heart for them and he was praying for them. He was motivated to pray because he had actual human beings in mind. And when we think of the reasons, and one of those reasons is people, that will motivate you to pray. When you think of your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother, your daughter, your son, your friends, your family, actual people, then you will do what Paul did and pray. Paul was praying for Christians to see that God is worthy of praise. Why was Paul praying? He was praying because he had a reason to pray. He was praying because he had a purpose, and he was praying because he was thinking about people. And so we move from why he was praying to how Paul is praying. If you look with me again at our text, he said, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, I do not cease giving thanks for you making mention of you in my prayer. Now, there are a lot of verses in the Bible about that could shed light on how we should pray. But when we just look at this text, here's what we see. One, Paul is praying without ceasing. Literally, the word cease, which I thought was interesting, is literally the word um, pause. Uh, Paul was the kind of person who never took a break from serving the Lord. 
Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's a bad idea to take a break. You know, vacations are good and we all love that. But there's no such thing as a vacation from the Lord. And Paul wasn't that kind of person. He says in Romans 1, 9, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 2, 13 Paul says again, for this cause also, thank we God without ceasing. 2 Timothy 1.3, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of you in my prayers. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Paul extends his practice to a command to us to pray also without ceasing. I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish that I didn't have time to pray. Problems just tumbled about me and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me? I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on gray and bleak. I wondered why God didn't show me. He said, but you didn't seek. I tried to come into God's presence. I used all my keys at the lock. God gently and lovingly chided, my child, you didn't knock. I woke up early this morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take time to pray. I don't know who wrote that poem, but it's right on. This is how we should pray for each other as believers. We must work to be the kind of people who cease not to pray. We never press pause on prayer. How is Paul praying for Christians? He is praying first without ceasing, but also Paul is praying with thanksgiving. Ephesians 1.16, it's exactly what he says. He says, I do not cease giving thanks for you. I'm not sure if you think about this when you think about the kind of person the Apostle Paul was. You think of everything you know about the Apostle Paul. Um, this might not be the characteristic that comes to your mind when you think of him. Ever since he became a Christian... And, starting, and started following Christ on that uh, Damascus road, he suffered. Um, Paul suffered and suffered and suffered. Um, a short list here. Paul suffered in this way. He was arrested. He was beaten with rods. He was lashed with a whip five times receiving 39 lashes each time. He was stoned and left for dead. He was in danger from his own countrymen. He was in danger from the Gentiles. He was in danger from false teachers. He had sleepless nights. He suffered in hunger and thirst. He suffered over and over again. And it would be natural for us to think that a man who gave his life to follow God and to serve God and yet was suffering so much that he would just think to himself, is this even worth it? I give up. Living for God isn't working. We might think that, but that is not how the Bible describes the Apostle Paul. In Romans 1.8, we see the Apostle Paul saying this, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. 1 Corinthians 1.4, Paul says again, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.3, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Colossians 1.3, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.2, we give thanks to God always for you. 2 Thessalonians 1.3, we are bound to thank God always for you. 2 Timothy 1.3, I thank my God whom I serve from my forefathers. Philemon 1.4, I thank my God making mention of thee always 
in my prayers. I want to challenge you. Maybe you're here today and you're going through difficult times. And maybe nobody knows about it. Maybe you're here today and you're struggling. Maybe you're here today and you've been facing trial after trial and it doesn't seem to stop. Maybe you're here today and you're suffering. I want to encourage you to not give up on the God who will never give up on you. I want to encourage you to not stop living for the one who died on the cross for you. I want to encourage you to not focus on what you don't have, but to focus on the grace that God has shown to you. 124 years ago, this song was written, and it's wisdom that we desperately need. When upon life's billows, you are tempest-tossed. When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings. Every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. When you look at others with their lands in gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy, your reward in heaven nor your Lord on high. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend, help and comfort give you to your journey's end. An old song with terrific wisdom. We need to put that into practice because it's very easy for us to forget the blessings of God and to focus on the little things. Paul's praying for Christians to see that God is worthy of praise. And in our text so far, we've seen why Paul is praying and we've seen how Paul is praying but now we're going to look at what Paul is praying. And we're going to see first that Paul is praying that Christians would know God. Look at Ephesians 1.17. He says, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In the knowledge of him. Paul's praying for Christ, that Christians would know God. Now if you look at that one way, you might be thinking, wait a minute. Why would Paul pray that Christians would know God? Aren't Christians the ones that already know God? Uh, yes, that's true. Christians already know God in terms of their salvation. But Paul is praying that Christians, that you would grow in your knowledge of God in terms of your walk with God, getting to know God in your relationship with God, who he is as a person. The biblical idea is that Christians, even though they are already saved, must grow in their knowledge of who God is. That's something that can't stop. You have to keep learning more and more about who God is as a person. 2 Peter 1, verses 2 and 3 says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you. How? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. How? Through the true knowledge of him. 2 Peter 3, 18. Peter says this, But grow in grace. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What comes into your mind when you think about God? What comes into your mind when you think about God? This was the famous question asked by a man named A.W. Tozer in a book entitled The Knowledge of the Holy. 
The book was named among the top 50 books that have shaped evangelicals. Listen to what he wrote in that book in 1961. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The history of mankind will probably show that no people has ever risen above its religion. And man's spiritual history will positively demonstrate that no religion has ever been greater than its idea of God. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at any at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christian, but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God. What comes into your mind when you think about God? And that's not really a question of, do you have a good theology? And that's not even a question of, have you ever learned what God is like in the past? That's about now, right now. What do you think about God? I think the Apostle Paul would agree. We as believers need to know God. At this point, I want to ask you, do you want to grow in your knowledge of God? Of course, you're probably thinking, yes. Well, I want to invite each of you, all of you right here, uh, to come to church a little earlier than you usually do on Sunday morning. If you came just one hour earlier, and went downstairs, you would have a great opportunity. At 10 o'clock every Sunday downstairs in our newly renovated fireplace room, thank the Lord, we are watching videos on the attributes of God. And I don't know, I could speak to say they are a blessing to have the privilege to watch a video from a man who probably spent hours and hours looking at God's word and looking at good Christian resources and putting together these portraits, they're beautiful, of our great God. It would be an hour well spent. Matter of fact, I challenge you here. There's like 12 or 13 of these series that we just started downstairs. Come and try it for a couple weeks. And if you're not blessed, you don't have to come back. Not that it's up to me to give you permission. I'm just, just saying. So what is Paul praying for? He's praying that Christians would know God and that as Christians are growing in their knowledge of God, the result will be that their eyes are opened the result will be that their eyes are opened. Look at verse 17 through 19, if you will. He's saying, he's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? When Paul prays that Christians would know God more, this is what he's praying. He's praying that they would know the hope of his calling. 
That's exactly what he says. I'm praying the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. Why? So that you will know what is the hope of his calling. As believers, we need to know the wonderful, precious, blessed hope that comes from the fact that God has called us to salvation. The hope that comes from God's calling you and calling me. There is security in that. There is security in that. Paul said in Romans 8, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Who are they? To those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be preeminent among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Brothers and sisters, I have good news for you. Good news. God is rich beyond measure. And God has decided to adopt you into his family. God has decided to give you a glorious inheritance with his own dear son. God has decided to transform you and to transform your, your life for his glory and for his praise. And you know what? This is guaranteed. If you're a blood-bought child of the King of Kings, Nothing and no one will stop God from blessing you. Paul is praying that Christians would know the hope of his calling. There is tremendous, unplumbable hope in God's calling. If you need hope as a Christian, ponder that. Because if you need hope as a Christian, you're not pondering that. We must focus on this hope of God's calling. And that's what Paul's praying for these believers. They're believers. He's not saying you're not saved. He's saying you're saved. You need hope in what you already possess. Paul is also praying that Christians would know the riches of the glory what he says that I pray that you will know the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints now I don't know if you studied this verse before but it seems to me that I'm finding there's a lot of debate here on this text is it saying Paul is praying that we as Christians would know the riches of our inheritance or is it that Paul is praying that Christians would know the riches of God's inheritance I think the answer is yes. Yes. It's like one commentator put it. This inheritance is his, and yet it benefits. Its benefits for us come graciously from him as we share in it. We are God's inheritance. We are God's possession. I can't fathom why, but we are for his grace. And yet we are beneficiaries. And the Bible says that we are uh, heirs with Christ. Co-inheritors with Jesus Christ. There is a danger in forgetting our inheritance. There is a danger in forgetting these truths. In Psalm 73, the psalmist said, Truly, God is good to Israel. Even to such as are of a clean heart. He's saying truly God is good to Israel. Then he says in verse 2. He gives like a personal testimony. But as for me. My feet. Were almost gone. My steps. Had well nigh slipped. He said I almost forgot. What happened? He said, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw 
the prosperity of the wicked. He was looking around as a child of God and looking at others. Look at that person living in sin. Look how blessed they are. Man, they have a lot. I was started to get envious of that. He said, I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity. When I thought to know this, when I thought about this, he said, it was too painful for me. It hurt him to look and to think these people are more blessed than me. These unsaved people are more blessed than me as a child of God. He had that health and wealth prosperity doctrine, which was foolishness. Then he said in verse 17, and here's, here's, the, here's the answer. Until I went to church. <laughs> he said, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Because he went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. And it all made sense. Then he realized, wait a minute, they're not the blessed ones. I am. Praise the Lord. Surely God is good. That's the point. Paul's praying that Christians would know the hope of his calling. He's praying that Christians would know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And Paul is praying that Christians would know the greatness of his power. It's exactly what he says. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? The truth of the matter is, and I don't know if I'm just saying this because I'm getting older and starting to feel, you know, little tiny little weaknesses here and there. Uh, as I hold my thumb, it's sore right now. Uh, we are weak. We are weak. We are weak physically. Unless you're young, I know you're strong. Don't worry, you'll get there. We are weak emotionally. I know we like to think we're strong there, but we're, we're not oftentimes. We are weak spiritually. And because we are weak, God wants us to be reminded that although we are weak, He is strong. And Paul is praying that our eyes would be opened to see the surpassing greatness of God's power toward us who believe. I love these words from a song that I'm not going to sing, but I'm going to read a couple of them here. Some victories are absolute, the battle over and won. But others we must face again, the fighting's never done. But in our weakness, God displays the power he has to give. To some he grants an end to pain, to some the strength to merely live. But he gives the power. In our text today, Paul is so very aware of how blessed God's people are. Paul is fully aware of this. But his burden, his concern, my concern, our concern, is that God's people might not realize it in their heart of hearts. I want to close this message by doing something a little uh, untraditional. So uh, bear with us. I'm going to show a quick video, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. Because it's so important as Christians that we not forget why we do what we do. Sometimes we get so focused on what we're doing, but we forget why we're doing it. And I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, a Christian comedian by the name of Michael Jr. But I found a clip that I know it's weird showing a clip in, in a service like this, but I, I felt like he got the point across so well that I just, I can't try to duplicate this. So listen carefully as he demonstrates the difference between focusing on what you are doing to focusing on why you are doing it. And after the video, I will close with one last word.
shouldn't have to listen if the, the video's acting weird. And then I'll call it real time. So every Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you should subscribe to, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Real Time on YouTube. So 3 o'clock, we got a new episode. One episode in particular, I'll share you a clip to you. We were in, uh, we in Winston Salem. So Real Time, this is how it works. I travel to the country, stand up on me, probably like an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny things happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interested. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at school. I was like, all right, I can teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just going to show you a clip. Check it. So you're musical director? Yes, sir. All right, so um, let me give you a couple of bars about the music director. the first part of that. Go ahead. So my prayer, and I believe the Apostle Paul's prayer in Ephesians, is a prayer that you and I as Christians wouldn't merely be focused on what we are doing for the Lord, as important as that is, but that we would never forget why we do it. And so we need to be praying for ourselves and for one another that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of our hearts being enlightened that we in our hearts might know. And that's what our prayer is. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness. We know only your Holy Spirit can help us. And we're praying that here at Bethel, you would continue to get the worship that you are worthy of. You are great and greatly to be praised. And so we pray that you would remind us, Lord, that we might give you the praise you deserve.